box up here is telling me which uh, orbital I'm talking about. So I'm in the first energy level, there's only the one S, right? So this is showing the boundary diagram. It's showing the outside of, if I, <coughs> if I just look at the area where there's 90% of the electron density, that's the boundary that holds that area, right? So we know in the 1S, it's a small spherical area that surrounds the nu nucleus and there are zero nodes, right? So let's look at the 2S. So there's the 2S. So what is this picture not showing me? Yeah, it's not showing me that there's a node inside. Right, so that's why on that slide we had a cross section. We we're looking at a cross section so we could see that that node was in there. But the takeaway here is that it's larger, meaning on average the electrons are further away from the nucleus, so they're not going to be as stable in there. They're going to be higher in potential energy, and they're not going to be in there in the ground state unless the 1s is already filled. Right? All right. So we talked about these already. There's one of the two p's. So this is a little bit different. So a lot of times in the textbook, you know, they show this as more of like a lobe. It's more elongated. I think this is actually technically more correct. So getting a, you know, a better calculation shows that the, the two lobes, so again, there's, a, there's the node here. There's no way you're going to see that. There's the node here. That's a planar node, right? in the P, and I have one lobe above that plane and one lobe below. The electron can never be on that plane, so that plane is extending out of the paper at you, it's coming out at you. Where's the highest probability for finding an electron if it's in this P orbital? It's really right on either side of that node, right? That's where this area here is where the electron density is greatest. So the electron is still relatively close to the nucleus on average, it's still in the second energy level. Those nodes are not very large, right? So let's look at the other two P's. So here's another one. Oh no, what, wait, what is this? Oh yeah, this one, this is the other one. It's on the z-axis, so it's coming out at us. So we really can't see much here. What's happening here, though, is one of the lobes is coming out at you, and it's eclipsing the other lobe pointing away from you, so you can't see it, right? So this is still the P, but it's on the z-axis. So let's look at uh, the one on the y-axis, right? So this one just looked like the one, oh, this is the one on the x-axis. This one looked like the one on the y-axis. It's just three-dimensionally pointing differently. So let's say you have <coughs> to put an electron into the 2P subshell. Let's say it's completely empty. I've got the 2px, the 2py, the 2pz. There's no electrons in that 2p. If I'm going to put one in, is there any difference in stability in terms of which one I put it in? No, the shapes of the 2px, y, and z are all exactly the same. The only difference is what axis they lie on three-dimensionally. There's no universal preference for x-axis over y-axis or anything like that. The average distance from the nucleus that the electron will be is the same if it's in the 2x, 2y, or 2p, uh, z. So since in the Western world we do things from left to right, we read left from left to right, we write from left to right, the general way you'll see people show where that electron is is they'll probably just put it on the left first. But there's no energetic reason why it has to be there. Okay, so it's also completely correct to put that electron here. It's the exact same energy. There's no difference in energy. It's not excited to move an electron from one orbital in the subshell to an equal energy orbital in the same subshell. I could also put it here. There's no universal preference for an upspin over a downspin. They're the exact same energy. Okay? So when I have multiple orbitals in the same subshell, they're called degenerate, which means they're all the same energy, and there's no reason why an electron would necessarily prefer to go in one over the other. 
Once I have an electron in there, though, that changes things, right? Once I have an electron in this, if there's an electron in this uh, orbital, it would be occupying the space on either side of that lobe. That creates some density of negative charge in there. In that case, it's uh, my next electron's not going, going to want to go in the same area where there's already some negative. If there's an empty p orbital on a different axis, it's going to go in that one instead, right? To avoid some of that repulsion. Which we'll talk more about about that a little bit later here. So if we keep going, I don't want to take too much time on this, but then again, the 3S is even larger. There are two nodes in there. It's not showing, but you want to make sure you're aware of those. <coughs> the 3P, very similar in shape to the 2P, except la uh, larger, on average, further away from the nucleus. So there's one on the Y axis, the, then there's one on the Z axis, which you can't see the lobe behind because it's eclipsed. And then there's one on the x-axis. So those are pretty straightforward. And then we showed the 3D. Those are the clover-shaped ones. So there's that one. There's that one on the axis that there was some eclipsing you can't see. This is the one with the donut. So that's just a different perspective looking like from the top instead of from the side. Again, there's some eclipsing there, so you can't really totally see. I already looked at those. Where am I at here? There. So there's the other one. on the. So it's the same shape, same energy. So again, if you're looking at the 3D, you've got five orbitals there. All five are equal in energy. So there's no reason why an electron would necessarily start off on the left-hand side. It could be anywhere in any one of those five, and it's the exact same stability or energy. So those are the ones we've already seen. So let's check out what the Fs look like. Because those aren't in your textbook. You might be curious about them. So let's skip down here to some of these Fs. So just to give you a sense for what the shapes look like, again, these come from the wave functions. I'm not going to hold you responsible for these shapes or ask you how many nodes are in the Fs, but I just wanted to you know, give you a chance to, to check them out because they kind of look interesting. And again, we're looking down from the top, so anything that's on the z-axis in front would be eclipsing something on the z-axis behind. So these have you know, some pretty unusual shapes, which is why we don't... Uh, which is why they don't go into that much detail in the textbook.